Hello my friends, hope y'all are doing well. It is my 55th birthday. How many of you know anybody that's turned 55 that can be as thrilled as I am? Probably not many. As I have shared with you guys in the past, I will be venturing on and taking an early retirement from my day job to apply extra hours here at the foundry. Very excited about this. There is a lot to look forward to and it will take a lot of stress off of me. I hope. I'm excited to see where this road takes me from here. As the title describes, we are going to be doing a video on molding the Muller plows. We're going to cast those in this video. Now, I did not get the first part of the mold making process. The video starts where I've already done the drag, flipped it over, and now I'm coping down. I think you'll find this interesting because I did some modifications on the mold to increase plow width and length without actually having to manipulate the pattern itself. As I said, I had already rammed up the drag and flipped it over when I realized I actually had a full battery in the camera. I didn't intend on doing a video on this because I was in such a hurry to get this done where I could get things, get uh, on to doing the furnace repair. But it just worked out, so I went ahead and included it. The plows are curved. Of course, I guess they all are. And uh, I'm doing some, I don't know, fairly interesting coping here, I guess. Now, I'm going to modify these. Uh, I've got a problem with the, the plow you see on the right, in the upper right. That scrubs the uh, outer or the inner part of the can. And it's got a radius down there in the corner that's leaving a circular ridge that doesn't get cycled back around. Along with that, that same plow, uh, the cutting edge is only about six inches high on the vertical end. So it's leaving a collar of sand stuck to the drum that doesn't fall off. It just stays stuck there. So I went ahead and increased the length of that cutting edge on the vertical part all the way to that interface or where you mount it. The other plow, I didn't worry about that. That's it. I, like I said, I haven't been having any problems. Now these are, uh, and <laughs> I messed up here. Uh, if I were to do it again, I wouldn't do it like that. I, uh, I don't have a parting line on these. There's no draft angle. Uh, and, you know, even though they're real thin, I am going to tear some sand loose. You wouldn't think you would with something like this, but it does happen. And uh, that's what the grinder's for. I got to tell you guys, I was at the post office the other day, and there was this little old lady coming along the wall. Uh, and she was struggling. She was walking pretty slow, and she had a cane, and she was also leaning against the wall as she was coming towards the door. So I waited for her and held the door for her, and <laughs> as she was thanking me, she was telling me about a week earlier, I don't know which pharmacy she was at. I don't know if it was Walgreens, CVS, but she said this old man, about 75 years old, held the door for her. And as she walked out the door, he leaned over and said, if you and I rode together, we could save a lot of gas. And she looked at me and she clenched her fist and she said, I told that dirty old man, I'm nobody's sugar mama. And I was kind of astonished at that. You know, I didn't, didn't know whether I wanted to ask why she felt that way about him, but she went on and told me, she said, I'm 87 years old and I don't take the first medication. And I'm sure not looking for some old man like that. He had a whole bag of meds. I'm not about to flip the bill for those. And, and anyway, uh, anyway, we we continued talking. I talked to her for about 45 minutes. I didn't mean to, but oh, uh, I'm always interested when I meet someone like that. I want to know if they may have knew my grandparents or where they were from and all. And it just so happened she did know of my grandparents, but she didn't know them personally. She grew up about four miles from where they were. And uh, but as we were talking. Uh, she was telling me about all her family <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, she didn't, she doesn't even know I got this channel. Of course, I'm not using her name, but, uh, she, uh, went on to tell me about her son. And, and if you guys are interested, if, if you're hunters, 
Uh, you ought to check this website out. It's uh, Steel Outdoors, and he makes some pretty nice shooting houses and other things there. And he's in Hazelhurst, Mississippi. So if you're in the Mississippi or Louisiana, even Alabama, uh, and you want to check something out, uh, go to their site and take a look. If, if if you're interested in anything and you're you're uh, wanting to talk to him, tell him that uh, his mama sent you. This uh, sprue is bad about fracturing the sand right there. And of all places, I want that pouring basin as tightly knit as possible. When I, when I, I go to cut my pouring basin in there, I want that thing rock solid. Uh, because that does take a lot of abuse and pounding as that iron hits it. And uh, so that's why I do that. And I've recently started doing that. Yes, I. this isn't something I've been doing all along. It pulled clean. And as you're going to see, the uh, I coped down several inches there. You don't realize it until I turn it this way. Now, this is how I'm going to modify them without actually modifying the pattern itself. I'm using a quarter inch round stock uh, pen, and I'm just scratching the sand away as I go along that lead edge. And I'm going to be able to define the point of these plows uh, with this method, since I'm adding some material to it anyway, I'm also going to be able to, as I said, define that point better. Now this plow, which throws the sand from the inside out, is not, it, it has not been a problem. Um, it's just the other plow. But I went ahead and added some additional ledge to it while I was at it, and here's where I'm defining that. And you can kind of see in comparison the point I'm making to the point it has. And as I said on the other plow, the radius is even bigger. So. And if I didn't say already, uh, I did not pour a, put a trap in this mold. I wish I had. But, you know, these I don't care what they look like, and, and you're going to tell I don't care when you see them because they do look rough. But uh, they're, they're only functional. This is not for anybody else. It's for me. If I were doing this for anybody else, they would never leave the building like this. But here I'm increasing the vertical cutting edge to scrape higher on the walls of the drum. And then I'm going to... You're going to see there's an island of sand between it and the uh, plow. I'm going to have to go in and remove that. Now, I went a little deep with that uh, where I scratched around it. It's pretty obvious when you see the castings, but uh, again... I don't care what they look like as long as they function. As I said before, I have a lot more dexterity using one hand opposed to two on most castings. But now on this particular one, I probably could have got away with two. Uh, I do read all my comments, guys. Don't think I'm not reading them. And there were two questions from two different guys in the last two weeks on the same thing that I'm, I'm going to go ahead and address now, and it was on, do I test my iron? And the answer is no, I don't have to. I, I did at one time to validate what I had, and we are going with that because there has not been a process change since we made some adjustments. The iron, which I do most of the time, as long as you use a consistent melt point, a consistent melting time, the uh, inoculant timing, along with the inoculant weight, the 
waiting, you know, 24 hours before you pull the mold along with the stress relief time. There is no need for me to have to worry about it because all the material that I'm putting in that furnace on that first generation melt is accurately monitored by the foundries that make these rotors. As if, and I have said this before, they go by a very strict standard all across the automotive industry on the composition of the rotors regardless of whether it's some of the alloy that I need or not, they always come out consistent, and the end result I've never had complaints with. If there's any chill in these castings, it's strictly from the pattern design, not my process. Now, there is some applications I wish I had a spectrometer for. Non-ferrous material, which I do little of here, it's very easy to get materials mixed up. You pretty much know what cast iron is, but you get into silicon bronze, manganese bronze, and other like red brass, yellow brass, all that stuff. It would be nice to have a little hand scanning spectrometer to just do a quick analysis of it to verify and validate you have what you're fixing to put in there. Unfortunately, I don't. Now, hey, it's my birthday. If y'all want to buy me one, it's in. But at this point, uh, I would have to send my samples to like Vericheck Technical Services. The guy that I talked to there, his name is Anthony Guzzi. And, uh, you know, they have everything that is needed to do proper testing on the, the metrology end of it. So there is routes for me to go if I need to do that. But the customer would have to pay for all that testing. With that said, I hope that answers your questions. Uh, I have I do everything to the book on my own process, and I don't have any problems with it because of that. Okay, my friends, looks like we've got two successful plows. Uh, I'm going to clean them up tomorrow after work. It's already about 10.30 tonight. I need to get some sleep. These are the plows. Now, because I cut the gates and the uh, runners much thicker than the actual casting, just to make sure that I had hot molten iron all the way to the point of entry, uh, I'm not going to be able to just snap these off with a hammer or I'll shatter the plow. So I'm going to have to go carefully and cut here, 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 and here to remove these. Now, Sooner had sent me some of these wheels here. We're going to use these to cut the gates and give them a try. Uh, they call it the Supreme Disc. And it's a little smaller than my other cutoff disc that I used from Sooner. But... Uh, Needless to say, we're going to give it a shot and see how these do. I'm probably going to crank the RPM up to max just because it's a smaller diameter. And with uh, those wheels, along came an assortment of other wheels. Uh, we got some more cutoff discs. I'm always using those. Some more grinding wheels. Some stones. I got some labels as well that I'll be stickering stuff with, so... Anyway, I'm anxious to try this out. We'll get started on that now.
I am using a platform up under this uh, vise that I grind from. The platform I did not make. The platform actually came with this tilting furnace that we brought back from Virginia. But for now, it is coming in very handy as an elevating platform for grinding. Due to my five foot six intimidating height, the blue junk there, uh, I will be explaining in another video coming up. We are using a different method uh, for a customer. He called the other day and is desperately needing this. And it's going to be a huge challenge for us because we've never done this before. Everything's a huge challenge around here. As I said, I'm going to crank this all the way up to the highest speed since I'm using a smaller diameter wheel. You can kind of make out what's going on here now. This is where I dug additional sand out to extend the, the uh, length and the width. These, uh, this one, where did I cut the gates? You, get, you got just a here. And then on this one, you got a little bit of an inclusion right here. Now, I didn't put a filter trap in these. Chances are these things are only going to be used uh, temporarily as I take the other plows and use those as a, a pattern and build them up. These are going to be more for testing than anything. So we're going to finish grinding these a little bit. Uh, this one keeps the sand pushed away from the center. This one scrapes the sand from the outside of the drum back inwards to the wheel. This little wheel did a good job. I, uh, I was surprised it sliced right through that. This is almost white iron. You've got, uh, it's, there's a lot of carbides there. Because I broke it out of the mold so fast, and I wanted it that way, I wanted to harden this material to a certain point. With that said, there's gonna be a lot of internal stresses. Am I gonna add a stress relief process to it? No. As I said, this is going to be temporary until we get some other plows made. And who knows? I may be using these things for 10 years.
because this stuff is so thin, uh, I'm gonna have to use a carbide drill here. I'll drill it out in two places and on each slot and then I'll go in and use the burr first and see if that'll cut it. If it won't, we'll have to move on to the grinding uh, wheel. Acting like a uh, twist reel probably would have cut this just fine. a little bit with it, but that's all right. Let's see if I can nib this out a little bit. I don't think this is going to work, but we'll try it. It'll be... Nah. Nah. Not going to work. So we'll go on over. So this is what we're going to have to chase out with the uh, uh, burr. I'm going to try it with the burr. I'm afraid this is going to be too hard. Uh, this, I should be able to do that just fine with a burr, but, but this is a whole different story. Well, it's taken about a month to complete this video. Uh, I, these two are the ones that I cast. I know they're bone ugly. Uh, I don't care. Yeah, I, that nobody's going to be looking at my plow. And this is possibly just temporary anyway. I've been doing a little experimenting here and there, trying to do some modifications with them. These two are the original plow. I messed up and broke the corner off on this one. I, it, I didn't have a, the clearance set right. And at that time, the profile along the bottom was not that flat, and it still isn't. And uh, it kicked sideways when I cut the muller on and snapped that point off. Luckily, that's the only damage I've got. Uh, the, uh, the one here works great. And this is the main one I need to recast anyway. You see that? You see the sharp point here? That is keeping all the sand off the bottom here when you get it. And it, you see how flat it is? All right, so you look at the one that I cast off of it, and you put it in the mounting position. You see the... Uh, it's... it's it's not flat at all across the bottom, which means it's not parallel to the bottom. And you see, I think I had it adjusted like this. So right down here at that corner, you had a huge ring of sand building up. And right here at the top where my finger is, that's where it would stop scraping the sides. And I would have that collar of sand from here up that would just stay stuck to the side of that drum. I took care of that by extending this. Now, uh, it works great. The 
uh, plow here and this plow. I'm going to keep those. I'm going to make some modifications, add them correctly on the actual pattern uh, instead of trying to scratch it in the mold the next time. And we're just going to put these up. Uh, if in the event we need to recast some more, we've got the set here. And I'm just going to make a few modifications just to help fluff the sand a little better as it's rolling around. One thing I may do, I may go ahead and extend this cutting edge another inch or two and then just bring the material across to the top here, right? If you can kind of visualize that. My muller has been getting in a bind and I was hoping that take it, putting this point on here was going to take care of that issue, but it did not. Uh, the muller is still in a bind, it's still uh, shutting down on me tripping the breaker every time I turn around and, and you know I don't know if it's the motor I'm not sure but uh, we're just gonna have to keep plugging along I don't have time to focus on it anymore right now I, this was a fairly easy job to do and like I said I've already been using these plows a little bit I took them off just now to check the witness the wear marks on them and uh, hit them with a grinder hit the high spots try to get them to conform with the base of the muller a little better. Hope y'all enjoyed it. Uh, one more thing, I want to congratulate Megan Callahan from Huntsville, Alabama. Megan is uh, my sidekick at the Sule Steam Festival. She has helped me a lot uh, making molds in earlier years anyway. She's all grown up now. She's a very bright young lady with a lot of potential in Megan, if you're watching, Josie and I wish you the best, and we're very proud of you. Keep in mind, we have been doing a lot in between the beginning of this video and now, uh, trying to get a lot of castings ground, a lot uh, produced to make an inventory available, along with getting some one-off jobs done for some people that are in dire need of their casting right now. I will be so glad to see August get here. Uh, and I, I hope and pray uh, this will put me ahead of the game after I retire from that other job. If it doesn't, I'm going to be in serious trouble here. <laughs> but uh, I'm hoping the extra... Uh, eight hours a day, plus the extra two hours driving to and from, right? Uh, that'll give me an additional 10 hours a day to apply to the foundry. It can't get here soon enough. I'm gonna miss my day job. I'm gonna miss uh, my coworkers. I work with some good people. I, I've honestly, I've got a gravy job there. Uh, it's it's a dream job. So it's, it's, it's difficult for me to just walk away from something that nice to, <laughs> to do this this kind of work in the evening time. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy it, I love it, but now this is not a hobby. I had somebody that referred to this as a hobby not too long ago, and I, it was it was hilarious. I couldn't help but laugh at, at that. Uh, no, my my hobby is wood carving, guys. If, if, if you think this is my hobby, you're, you're, you're way off. I, I uh, my, my ultimate hobby would be to sit down with a block of basswood, wood gouges, and just sit down and carve. I have to show you some examples of stuff I used to do years ago. I haven't been able to do that in quite a while. But, uh, y you know, one of my ideas earlier on uh, was I'd be able to, to utilize those carving skills and do some artistic casting later down the road. Well, <laughs> maybe I'll have some time later down the road now. For those that think this is a hobby, uh, you ought to come out and hang around with me for a while. You'll see just how fun this can be. Well, guys, you have a good day, and I'll talk to you later. For those who have been asking about the Windy Hill Foundry hats, these are now available on my website, windyhillfoundry.com, under stores, or you can click on the above link. These are on the pricey side, but keep in mind the shipping is included. Have a good day.